This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hello and welcome to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And today I'm talking about, oh, something really near and dear to my heart, um, gridlock, uh, barriers to net zero. We know we keep talking about how we're going to have this brand new transition to net zero and we're going to electrify everything. There's only one problem. The electric grid isn't ready for it. Projects are in the queue waiting forever for regulatory approval. And frankly, with the demand for EV chargers, it's just going to basically cripple an already outdated system. So that's a preview of what's coming today in the show. But first, I always like to get started with some really fun stuff, is in breaking news, or you can't make this stuff up. And in view of the holiday season, I decided to start with one of my favorite to uh, toys as a child, Legos. So if you want to put up the picture about Legos, you can see that the Lego has actually, the Lego company based in Denmark, has actually tried for many years to transition from an oil producing bricks to a poly, uh, synthetic, and I can't pronounce the chemical name, so I won't try. But they've actually abandoned their plans now after many years of testing from, they were trying to you know, make Legos from recycled bottles and soda cans and those stuff like this, but they spent years trying and they can't do it. They actually decided that they had pledged to use sustainable materials by 2032, but the problem was that the Lego bricks made from the recycled materials, first of all, require a lot new, more equipment, and actually investing it is a lot expensive, and it also involves even more steps in the manufacturing process, leading to, guess what, more carbon emissions. So the problem was <laughs> that the recycled materials actually cause more pollution to generate than the existing materials, so they're going to stick with what they have. They haven't given up on their hope of, uh, this is Lego headquarters in case you couldn't tell, they haven't given up on trying to get a more sustainable material, but the problem is the, re the recycled materials just didn't have what they call the clutch factor, which is basically inherent in the Lego. you would be able to put it together and take it apart and do all these different, you know, construction builds with it, right? They found that it wasn't as durable, the recyclable things, and it, and it wasn't as safe, and so now they're going to have to find an alternative. And having um, grown up with Legos, and I love Legos, in fact, now they've all evolved into all these wonderful, you know, architectural shape, shapes and things, and you can get, like, Star Wars, the Empire State Building. So Lego continues to develop interesting new designs, but they just can't quite figure out a way to re replace their ubiquitous brick with something more sustainable. And isn't that usually the case? Uh, we have great ideas, but the plans to put them into motion are usually what fails, um, which is sort of the theme of our show today, actually. And then I have another update. I love animals, as you all know. So now they're California. I've talked about New Zealand having a burp tax. Well, in California, the dairy farmers are actually deciding to move away from methane by putting a feed additive in the cow's food to help reduce the number of burps and belches it has. Okay, just what we need, more genetically modified food, right, in our milk. So apparently the Biden administration isn't behind this because they're funding grants up to $21 million um, to the dairy farmers to help promote feed additives that reduce this cow's um, discharges. Livestock, they say, are responsible for 14.5% of the greenhouse emissions in California. And so now they're saying, well, maybe we can get the cows, farmers, the dairy farmers should do something about that. And if we feed our cows something in their food, then that'll maybe help them um, not have as many uh, belches. I don't know. I'm always worried about when you start adding additives to food. Isn't that what we're supposed to get away from? But they said the cow can take waste and turn it into nutritious, which is great. But the problem is that they, they're also realizing, and this is really, I guess, the ironic part of the story. Um, they said they can reduce as much, they, they think they can reduce 300 metric, 300,000 metric tons of carbon by doing this food additive. Um, it'll be a huge win. But the cooperatives, farmers, volu is voluntary. You know what they discovered? 
the farmers are more apt to do something if it's voluntary than if it's required. You think? The entire Energy Star program is voluntary, and it's been a real success story. So forcing you to do something is probably not a good approach, as opposed to giving the farmers money to do it on a voluntary basis. Who knew? But the White House says the grants are part of the billion dollars announced in its regional conservation partnerships. So this is our IRA tax money helping to feed cows additives so they won't belch quite as much. Um, again, you cannot make this stuff up. And then the other thing that's really scary to me is that there's now something, and I actually read a couple stories on this, is that now there's a new travel passport that says that actually um, you now have this, this travel agency called Intrepid is now going to think that they need to issue carbon passports. Now, is anybody else concerned about the notion of free Big Brother telling us how often we can fly and, more importantly, where we can fly? So there's some ideas have floated this carbon passports as a way to combat climate change. We could also just not have all these people fly to COP28 in their private jets, too, right? The jet fuel burn to keep a plane running is a source of CO2 emissions, according to an Oxford study, yes. And they now have contributed to what they believe human-caused global warming. Um, something I'm not going to debate today. But one of the most extreme solutions is that they now said that maybe we can start limiting travelers to how many times they can fly per year and when they can fly and where they can fly. This sounds an awful lot like a socialist government, right? Um, the one co extreme solution has been the climate activists have floated the idea of a carbon passport that, holds, um, that tells how many times you've flown during the year and if you pass a certain threshold, you aren't allowed to fly anymore. Well, gee, I'd be out of luck. Uh, a new report also says that the personal carbon allowances are a likely scenario as climate change gets worse. Oh, that's kind of scary. So they, these allowances would manifest as passports to force people to ration their carbon in line with um, travel guidelines. In fact, they'll also start limiting when you can visit Holland or the Maldives and, and how long you can stay there and where you can go. Um, so this is a story that I'll, I'll want to explore further in future episodes, but it's a really scary idea that not only are they coming for our cows, they're also trying to protect us, prevent us from flying where we go on our vacations or for business travel. Um, but that doesn't seem to stop John Kerry, now does it? Um, this is the KJ Show on the Bull Brave TV Network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio.
And welcome back to the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. And today I'm talking about this continuing issues with gridlock and how the grid, the American grid, is really becoming a stumbling block to these goals that Biden has set forth for a net zero economy. And basically, you know, the grid is not one one monolithic thing. In fact, we can show the picture. The grid is actually made up of multiple interconnection points on a regional basis. And the problem is that this grid is really old. Um, the electric grid, people forget, took a long time to build. We didn't just all of a sudden electrify everything in 15 or 20 years. It took a long time, um, about a 50 or 60 years, actually. The grid, the, But the problem is because this grid is the way it's designed and it's old, a lot of the clean energy projects that Biden is promoting is actually not able to be hooked up to the grid for a variety of reasons. One is they, 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 they don't have the regulatory authority in place to do it because there's all these disparate uh, interconnection points. These are all controlled by regional operators. And so Biden's drive for a green economy is actually facing a significant bump. I don't know why they didn't think about this when they were making all these rules and all these plans to electrify everything, because the grid just simply isn't ready. 93% of all new uh, energy projects that were supposed to be connected um, could, could actually help us achieve these goals. But most of them, about, uh, most of them are disconnected or never. Um, and if they aren't hooked up, then we don't have the power they, they need, right? So the grid is really critical to this green energy uh, revolution that we keep talking about. So I could take the grid down. Uh, a study found that between two, 2000 and 2016, 72% of the grid connection requests for like renewable energy projects, wind and solar were actually eventually withdrawn because it takes... It went from 19 months, a little under two years, to almost four years to work through all the red tape to get these projects connected in the, to the grid in this particular regional area. 23% um, of the projects make it through the queue, and that makes it obviously very difficult for the independent grid operators to make a profit. You know, they want to put up a wind farm, but they can't connect it to the grid, and they think that they're going to get money out of it, and then there's regulatory pushback, and it never happens. So they lose money. So expert says one of the problems is part of the infrastructure is the regulations that are given, and which prompt developers to flood it with requests and then withdraw them. And then the other problem is that they're saying that there's a growing number of weather events. They think it's caused by man-made global warming. We can agree to disagree on that point, but their weather is changing and weather does do that. But so the fact that we've had more storms and weather-related outages have also created more pressure on the grid, too. So whether it's climate change or not, the point is the weather is creating stress on the grid and more outages. And last summer, California actually told its citizens to stop conserve energy to save the grid because there was too much demand on the grid. Um, and then households are actually experiencing about seven hours of outages a year um, in, on average, which, you know, is not good. I'm in the electric utility world, and that's not a good figure. Um, electric utilities strive to have hardly any outages, but storms happen, volcanoes, wind, hurricanes, things happen, right, beyond our control. So the problem is that we have outages caused by weather, which may or may not be getting worse, and we have an old ancient grid, and now we're starting to cre increase the demand on the grid through electric chargers and all these other increases to the to the grid to the American usage. America will need additional gen you know electricity generation, um, but we just don't have it because the grid isn't working. One of the consultants for who grid strategies told Newsweek magazine, the number one reason for the delays in the interconnection queue is the wait list is so projects to be connected and limited transmission. So you have all these ideas, all these folks and capitalists trying to connect to the grid, but they can't because it's a regulated monopoly with a lot of bureaucracy associated to it. And also, rightly so, I mean, the grid is really important, and obviously we need a good grid from security, if nothing else, but now we are overwhelming it with these increased demands. So you have hundreds of different project developers trying to use whatever capacity there is and apply for interconnection, 
for the utility, and they usually can't get those approved, those requests approved. Um, researchers at Princeton University, this is another issue, pointed out that to, for the U.S. to meet its net zero goals, we need to triple our transition transmission capacity. So we have to triple the transmission capacity we have to build the electric grid, but we can't do that because we don't have the regulatory ability in place and the current projects, most of them are withdrawn. I don't understand how this is a reasonable solution to our energy issues. A report by Grid Strategy found grid congestion cost, 14, $13 billion, and will continue to arise. And more important, attempting to plan the grid transmission system through the connection process doesn't make sense, according to this grid expert. And he said that in order for us to have a grid that works, then we're going to have to triple the ability, which means we're going to have to invest somewhere, I love these estimates, somewhere between 2.9 um, to more than 50 billion by 2030. So between two, 3 million and 50 billion, 3 billion and 50 billion. That's a big range, right? And this is on top of all the other costs that I've talked about in previous shows about the mammoth expenses it takes to build electric grids and to develop wind, shore, wind farms and develop solar arrays. So, you know, that's another couple billion dollars at least, probably more. Um, so this is a problem. And then my favorite thing um, that I found, and I've talked about carbon uh, capture storage before in uh, previous shows. Well, apparently Biden thinks that that's a solution to help, you know, reduce emissions. And they want to start promoting, the administration wants to start promoting carbon capture storage, right? As a way to eliminate the emissions and to help capture the carbon emissions and bury them deep in the earth. And that will be really good for, um, that's a one, one strategy. The problem is it actually causes environmental damage and may actually lead to more oil drilling too, because now they'll find more oil when they start digging down in the earth to bury the carbon emissions. They also will start extracting the fossil fuels. So how does that make sense? It doesn't. But then again, we have a lot of problems and challenges ahead of us, and certainly an outdated grid that will take up to $50 billion to fix is one of them. Um, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. You're watching the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hi, and welcome back to the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Johnson. And today we're talking about gridlock and the barriers to net zero. It's a topic I've talked about in previous shows, but 
in light of all of the new regulations and this continuing push for net zero, I thought I'd revisit it because I found some more interesting information about just how difficult it's going to be to transform this grid and, again, how much money it's going to cost. So a lot of the regulatory constraints really are the issue here. Um, there's outages, of course, which I've talked about, and increasingly severe weather. Now, my husband's a meteorologist. He'll argue with you about whether weather is happening now or if you want to look at the long-term effects of weather. So I'm not getting into the debate of whether it's human-caused weather, um, which seems like an oxymoron to me. But anyway, um, but the grid, even though the clean energy business is doing well and we're having some solar farms and windshore farms, though we've had some setbacks on those too, but the progress could be even better if we had a grid in place. And as that map showed you just how disconnected the grid really is, and the transmission wires and the transformers are decaying, they're old. Some, some of these transformers are 25 or 30 years old, um, even older, sometimes 40 years old. So the seven grid regional operators in the United States are underestimating the growth threat of both severe storms and also the increased demand in the grid. The risk models that they're using, frankly, um, are outdated and they actually are relying on, on outdated information. So even the modeling they're using to project how much grid infrastructure they need to build is outdated because they're not using current weather models. Um, and I love this. Somebody described one of the reports I found, decrepit in power infrastructure in, in the world's largest economy is among the biggest obstacles to expanding the clean energy and combating climate change. Well, that makes sense. And I, again, it gets back to who's, who's thinking about these policies. We have these grand plans to sort of electrify everything and have everybody go clean, and it's supposed to just happen automatically, when no one really thinks about the huge costs and just the physical difficulties of updating transmission lines. I mean, you think about how much it costs just to update a transmission line or to underground it, in, in, in that costs a lot of money. I was involved in a Florida utility, public utility, municipal utility years ago, and we started undergrounding. Well, undergrounding for a little municipal of 30,000 people is a big, big task. Can you imagine doing that nationwide? It's, it's enormous. So grid um, maintenance is something that's been sort of forgotten in this process because, frankly, nobody really wants to think about the wires. They want to think about, ooh, it's fun, it's clean energy, it's sun and solar. No, it's not. It's, it's heavy-duty maintenance that's required and upgrading that's required. So um, the competition, you know, the renewables is actually being strangled in this industry because they don't have adequate and necessary upgrades to the transmission network according to the executive director of the Southern Renewable Energy Association. So the renewable guys want to get their, get their projects in line, and they can't because of the regulatory constraints. The federal government lacks the authority to push through all these grid maintenance requirements. So you have the federal government demanding us switch to EVs and switch to electrification, but the federal or the, the state or regional grid operators aren't under the federal authority. Maybe that's good, maybe that's not but it doesn't seem like they're working together. Under the current regulatory regime, the needed infrastructure investments are controlled by a web of local, state, and regional regulators who have political incentives and agendas too, um, and they want to hold down spending. The power sharing among states and regions is often conflicting interests, makes it challenging to coordinate a national strategy and to moderate the, modernize the grid, according to a, person, a spokesperson from FERC, the federal Elect Energy Regulatory Commission. So don't you think maybe Biden should have thought about that or his administration or the Department of Energy should have said, hey, you know what? The grid isn't all one organization. We need to figure out a way to get through all this red tape before we start pushing for demand, an increased demand on our electricity grid. And then the other thing is it's showing that the average age of large power transformers is about 40 years old, which is getting to their useful life, their estimated useful life. And if you want to put up the grid, the picture here, that U.S. outages has actually increased due to weather. Again, I'm not going to argue whether it's human-caused weather or not. The point is the weather is changing and it's getting worse, and that's also causing extreme pressures on the grid. Um, we had the grid outage in Texas. We had the grid outages in California. We've had grid outages all across the country, and it's increasing for whatever reason, whether it's natural or man-made. 
But the point is the weather is going through a pattern now where storms are getting more severe over time. And the current models aren't taking that into account, which is another worry. So we can, thanks for the graph. Um, so this consultancy group, Marsh McLennan, estimates that more than 140,000 miles of grid transmission lines will need to be replaced by 2050. 140,000. That's a lot. <laughs> That's the United States back and forth a few times, right? And the cost of now, this cost went from 50 billion. This Marsh McCollin is saying it's actually going to be $700 billion to replace the transmission lines um, and to fix all of the upgrades needed to maintain a transmission capable of dealing with the nation's future power needs. Um, uh, Princeton thought actually, went, went back and said, well, it may be take a billion. Well, it might take a trillion dollars. So again, we're looking at an awful lot of money. It doesn't really matter if it's 50 billion, 700 billion, or a trillion dollars. It's money that's coming from us, and it's not going to. And we need to invest in that. Now we have a hard enough time getting money to build infrastructure for roads, right? How and where is the money coming for this infrastructure for the grid replacement and the grid upgrades? Well, it comes from the utilities, but those are the ratepayers. That's us again. And this is something that is a monumental task that I don't think anyone's really considered in this push for a clean, green economy. Um, the responsibility for grid maintenance, upgrades, and interrelated connections is shared among state and local governments. So here's what the problem is. No one's in charge. There's no one in charge of this grid expansion, this grid upgrade effort, because it's all these different interconnectors that work together to sell electrons across the United States. And it says, because the operators have little independent power over modernization, rather they simply are associations, the system is failing because none of these players have individually have the power or the responsibility to basically solve the problem, to maintain the grid in the national interest. Well, that's scary too. So the ambition, the administration's climate agenda would it would add more wind and solar and, and to a creaky grid, but that just creates the transmission problems and makes it worse. So even though we have these technologies, we don't have the ability to get them, to, to have them actually connect to the grid and provide power. In fact, this is one of the few comments I thought from John Kerry was really amusing. He said, basically, uh, we can send a rover to Mars, but we can't send an electron to California from New York. And that is absolutely true. So we cannot... There's not ability right now for America to have a trans efficient transmission network in the electric grid. So how are we going to get to net zero? How are we going to reach all these ambitious goals? The answer is I don't think we can. And the cost is, again, astronomical. So it just tells me that there's this rush to green energy, but there's no real thinking or uh, no plans in place. There's no strategic planning. It's all tactics. There's no strategy, and that isn't really a good approach to run the comp company, run the country, or even you know run our national grid, our electric grid. Um, it's a little scary to me. Um, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV network. You're watching the KJ Show, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. 
Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host of the Bold Brave TV Network. Um, you're welcome to call in, 866-451-1451. Unfortunately, my regular call-in person is, is preoccupied today. So hopefully I'll get a caller, but you never know. But please call in and talk to me about, join a conversation about whether we're talking about the grid and the gridlock, having to do with the electric grid or anything else on energy. I'd love to chat with you. Um, but just in case we don't have any callers, I am prepared. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, we're already talking about how cows are bad, right? And they want to do additives in their food and all this stuff. In New Zealand, they actually wanted to put in masks on the cows and diapers. It just seems crazy. But young people, those millennials and young, probably Generation Zs now, are embracing a new food strategy called reductitarian food movement. Okay, so I guess they've given up trying to make us all vegans and vegetarians. So now they're saying, oh, you don't have to give up meat entirely. You just have to cut back on it. Sounds like kind of like my doctor, right? Uh, the mission of the Reductitarian Foundation is, according to the association website, to improve human health, protect the environment, and spare farm animals from cruelty by reducing societal consumption of animal products. Sounds great, sounds noble, but is it really sensible? Well, that's a whole other thing, right? So why is eating less meat important? Well, that's a good question. And apparently these reptitarians are all over it. They're saying the overconsumption of meat, eggs, and dairy is destroying the environment, causing poor treatment of animals, promoting major health risks, and contributing to the global crisis like world hunger. Um, okay, I don't really see the logical thing with global world hunger and eating meat, but okay, we'll let them go with that. But this is, again, I love it when the youngsters try to tell the older folks how to, what we should do and blame us for bad decisions that they didn't, you know, that we're forcing them to make. Uh, many people, particularly younger people, are switching to low meat diets. And according to one study, young people consider, are considering the environmental impact of their menu choices more than those in the older generation. Conversely, men aged 50 to 65 are responsible for 50% of the total beef consumption in the United States with devastating impacts for their health and the health of our planet. Okay, I also want to point out that I covered a so similar story a few weeks ago when Greta Thunberg was advocating how the, gener you know, the boomers have actually created this calf havoc and created all these problems and are creating climate change. But when they started to look at it, the young people were actually doing less to reduce their climate footprints compared to the older folks who actually think more about recycling and are actually more take more care and understanding because frankly we read labels and we think and we have experience and we I don't like being told by a 20 year old what I should or shouldn't eat. Um, so I just think this is one of those again a good intentions run a rot run run amok where we have these youngins lecturing to us about what we should eat and how we should eat it when frankly uh, we need a well-balanced diet. In fact a lot of the research that I've done in the show and I've talked about it previously has experienced that the vegan and vegetarian diets are actually not very healthy at all and actually may cause, wait for it, more global emissions than other other types of food. And oh, by the way, plants have feelings, so maybe we're not supposed to eat plants either. Um, you know, I believe in having a well-rounded economy, which includes selling dairy, meat, eggs, cheese. That's just part of the reason God made us, gave us cows and, and sheep, and those are sort of what I think of. And if you don't want to eat meat, that's great. But, you know, you don't have to force an entire generation to give it up. Uh, I always like it when they, uh, when they uh, lecture us, right? They know best. Um, whatever happened to Father Knows Best, right? Oh, that's sorry. That was the 1950s paternalistic show. I know. Except he, the ironic things. He never knew anything. Um, and so eat less meat is also the message for the rich world, first world. So they're also telling the first world people, us Americans, 50% of us eating all the meat, that the first net zero plan is, you know, really to save the planet, the first world, 
all the developed countries should stop eating meat. The world's most developed nations should be told to curb their excessive appetite for meat as part of a comprehensive approach to, to halt, to bring the global agri-food industry into line with the Paris Climate Agreement. So to meet our goals, which by the way, we aren't gonna be able to do, we need to stop eating meat. Nations that can overconsume meat, I love it, will be advised to limit their intake while developing countries who are under consumption of meat adds to nutrition challenges, see, you do need meat, it needs to improve livestock farming. Great, yeah, I, I think that we do need to improve livestock farming in the undeveloped world. And from four, farm to fork, food systems account for a third of the global greenhouse gas emissions, and much of that is limited to livestock farming. And though it's non-binding, the FAO is expected to inform policy and investments. The problem is, you can't really tell rich people what to do or rich Americans what to do. The guidance on meat, though, is intended to send a clear message to governments, but politicians in richer nations probably aren't going to go along with it. You really think the French are going to go along with not eating meat or the Germans? I mean, come on, let's get serious here. Uh, they said typically nations shy away from policies aimed at influencing consumer behavior, especially when it involves cutting consumption of everyday items. Yeah people don't like to be told what to do. Livestock is particularly sensitive, said the founder of a new organization called Climb Eat. And if we don't take the livestock problem seriously, we won't solve climate change. But they also admit that you can't start lecturing Western countries that they can't eat meat. So again, it, we have these socialist agendas. They can tell us how much we can fly on our carbon passports. They can tell us what we should or shouldn't eat meat wise. And I'm wondering who made up all the rules? And by the way, who put them in charge? Um, I don't understand it. And again, they're, they're already starting to have research that says no matter what we do, we aren't gonna meet the 1.3 climate you know, degree warming. That's gonna happen, that's an inevitability. It's coming out slowly in the news. So all this stuff we're doing to prevent global warming isn't working, right? So why are we doing it? And if it isn't working, and I think the Earth's been warmer than it has in the past, too. And the Earth didn't explode. It warms and cools, warms and cools. So well, the problem I have is that I really don't like it when people, organizations, under the guise of telling us how to behave, end up telling us what we can do, where we can fly, what we can eat, and how that's all supposed to be wrapped up into this global climate change issue. But at the end of the day, this isn't going to solve the problem. And more fundamentally, we have other problems to think about. We have problems about just simply building a grid that can handle the increased demand, So, which I'm going to talk about next. So I'm sorry no one called in today, but hopefully you're enjoying the show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Boldberry TV network on The KJ Show, and I'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. 
Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. And today I've been talking about some of the barriers or gridlock to this uh, shifting to net zero. And so I thought I'd really point out not just the grid issues, but something even more obvious. According to some recent studies, apparently there aren't enough electricians to fix America's broken EV chargers. And if you remember the show I did a few months ago talking about our Department of Energy's road trip with her EV and that most of the chargers were broken, apparently that's a real big problem. So using data from, again, the Department of Energy, Auto News pointed out that there are nearly 4,000 EV, four, four, of the nearly 4,000 chargers and the 7,000, 70,000 charging parts, see, about, they have a pretty high 6% outage rate. And so the problem is they don't have the electricians to fix these chargers. They are um, finding a high level electrician called a journeyman who is specifically trained on EV chargers is a significant challenge. So not only do we have a broken grid, we have a shortage of skilled electricians to fix the EV chargers that are uh, charging stations that are out not working. Um, so this Trout Electric post president said, if you came to me right now and a journeyman that's been in the EV charging industry for the last couple of years, he or she'd be hired on the spot. So our wonderful EV push, the study, the, the DOE is projecting that the U.S. will need 142,000 more certified electricians by 2030. But the problem is the labor poll of electricians is expected to shrink 14%. So people, electricians are retiring. The baby boomers are saying, okay, I'm done. And they're not getting trained on EV charging stations. So even among electricians that can do the job, many aren't certified to work on EV installations. In fact, in the electric industry, there's always been a shortage of good, competent electricians. I mean, that's one of the things the electricity, the electricians are really important to the electric industry. Well, they're becoming even more important and they're not even getting the training or there's not enough training to train them on how to fix these chargers. One startup company called Charger Help is working to help you know, increase this gap through workforce education, and that's terrific, and being an electrician is an important and necessary trade, and we need more of them, but it's going to delay the lack of electric electricians. It's going to delay the EV transition more. So not only do we have a decrepit grid, we don't have enough infrastructure of people to do the job. Um, one of the governments, they said the government's aggressive push to electrify the transportation sector is based on the premise that will have the help the environment. However, what they haven't really thought about is they don't have enough workers to do it. And, that, and also the fact that when you start looking at the life cycle of the elect of electric car versus internal combustion engine car, they're realizing that actually it isn't as, as good as you thought that actually um, electric, internal combustion engines use, generate less carbon emissions over their life cycle than an electric car because the electric car uses the rare earth minerals. So electric cars aren't necessarily good for the environment either. That's another story that's come out. So um, they think that in order to get enough grid, enough electric chargers in the system, it's going to take, now I already said it takes about 700 to a trillion dollars to update the infrastructure and the grid. Well, it's going to take another 127 billion to install 28 million chargers by 2030, according to Enro. Again, where's all this money coming from? And a new report from National Renewable Energy Lab said 30 million to 42 million electrical vehicles are going to be on the road, but they don't have the chargers in place, which creates range anxiety. And, they, and the widespread build-out has to focus on homes and multifamily residents. The problem is that, home, that apartment buildings are pre preventing putting up electric EV chargers for safety reasons. And the mid-adoption scenario of 33 million plug-in vehicles will require 26 million more. Um, oh, I have a caller from Honolulu. Oh, come on in. 
if you want to call, join the join the call. Hello? Yes, I had a Hi there. quick observation, if you don't mind. It's Carla. Hello. What's your observation, yeah, I was sir? Gonna say, I was going to say most of the electric cars that are sold in the United States are in sunny states, and yes. there's not that many in states where it snows or it's really cold. So I was wondering, uh, this year, maybe you keep an eye on those statistics telling you uh, how many cars got stuck in the snow on the highways and freeways this year. That's a, that's that's a great point. Thank you, and you're absolutely right, uh, because they've done studies that electric vehicles' ability, their range, declines in cold weather, and they do get stranded in the snowy. They can't start in the snow. In fact, I saw a really funny picture where this guy in Finland was trying to use a toaster to warm up his EV battery, and he actually ended up having the car catch on fire. So, and Finland obviously has a lot of snow. So that's a really excellent point. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Good day. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you so much. So it's true. Uh, by an electric car dealerships, 400 of them have dropped out of selling electric vehicles because they just can't sell them. So the caller makes a good point about the fact that they don't work well. And you know, they also said Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Um, the study said that we're going to need to. So we have. So just to kind of recap, we have a grid that isn't ready, and we have an electric charger systems that aren't ready. And we still are pushing forward with this, these goals. Um, that doesn't sound like a well thought out, conceived plan to me. Um, they, they said that the, these other studies, and these are from national laboratories. These are not my opinions. These are studies funded by the federal government who's saying we need 28 million chargers, but we don't have the money and the infrastructure to do it. We don't have the electricians to fix them. And we're going to need to continue to work together, they say. But, you know, we really, Americans right now, we don't necessarily working together and we're certainly not united in this green energy push politically. Um, so the NREL study said the cumulative capital investment will, again, be between 53 and 127 billion, more money. And of that, um, they need different charger levels. There's level one, there's level two. It isn't just one, like, it's kind of like the different fuel grades. So not only is not all electric chargers are created equal, there's also different charging, whether fast charging or, or slow charging, and slow charging takes all night. And, and so, and then the other problem is there's a regulatory problem because only electric utilities are allowed to sell on a per kilowatt basis. So these electric charger stations are actually running into regulatory roadblocks. They can't operate because they're not licensed to sell electricity on a per kilowatt basis because they're not a utility. So the whole point was there's a lot of, you know, good, grandiose plans, aspirational plans to reach net zero, but we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the money. We don't have the tra workforce. We don't have a strategic plan in place to get us there and certainly not by 2050. And again, it's not me saying this. It's government labs, it's experts in the field, it's folks in the field like electricians who are telling us we're not ready and I don't know if we're gonna be anytime soon. But I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. Um, you're watching the Bold Brave TV network on the KJ Show and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. 
Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And the last caller did say Merry Christmas, but we cut him off. So actually, that was it's a nice segue into this fun final segment, because today is St. Nicholas Day, which um, is near and dear to our heart because my youngest son is named Nicholas. And so when, along, when he started showing up years ago, um, we actually started celebrating St. Nicholas Day, which is basically the original version of Santa Claus. He was a fourth century uh, saint and he was lived somewhere between Turkey and Greece and actually my daughter and I went to visit his hometown and he is the patron saint not only of children but also of sailors and so it's kind of fun when you're in we were in Turkey at the time because Turkey and Greece sort of changed their geography so I'm in Turkey on this conference and I go and visit St. Nicholas's homeland, home, home birth site, and there's St. Santa Clauses everywhere. And it's like, okay. So the notion of St. Nicholas has then evolved into Santa Claus. And, and he was basically very kind to children, and he was very kind to sailors. And they made it a Western feast day on December 6th um, because he was associated with the festival of Christmas in many, many um, countries. And in Europe, in St. Nicholas Day, you put your shoes out in, in front of your bedroom, and if you're a good little child, you'll get candy. Um, so my kids loved St. Nicholas Day, and they had, I never knew they had so many shoes because we were putting in candy in all these different shoes, right? Um, but they had to be good, so they were good for, for the time it took to get their St. Nicholas candy for sure. Um, the Dutch colonists are the ones, the immigrants are the ones that took the notion of St. Nicholas back to New York or New Amsterdam at the time, now New York City, and the American colonies of the 17th century adopted and then became Santa Claus. And he was a kindly old man who was also linked back to the Nordic festivals, because there's Nordic fables too, which is why Santa Claus supposedly, well, no, Santa Claus does live in Finland. Um, there's Santa Claus Village. And there's actually, you can visit Santa Claus Village. And um, and there's also, I swear, Santa Claus goes fishing in Minnesota in August because we saw him. Uh, but the legend of a kindly old man um, who, you know, punishes naughty children and gives good children presents. So that has become the image of St. Nicholas and Santa Claus United States. So, you know, I really think that we have to get back to, yes, Santa Claus is a great symbol for loving children, but we also have to remember that he was a saint, which meant he was a Christian, and he was actually tortured. Uh, St. Nicholas was tortured for his faith before he fled back to his hometown. So Christianity, you know, needs to, we need to focus on Santa Claus wasn't just about giving presents, but he was also about celebrating the birth of Christ, which is the whole notion of Christmas, right? Um, but I thought it was really fun having a Saint, our own little Nicholas in the family, not necessarily our own Saint Nicholas, but a Nicholas no, 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 nonetheless. And it is really wonderful when we see how these these stories get, get passed from Europe to the United States and then become part of our American culture as well. And, um, and in Europe, it's Père Noël in France and Father Christmas in England. And it's just to me, if we don't if we don't focus on the materialism, but we focus on the joy of having children sort of understand the the, re the real meaning behind Christmas of joy and giving and being thankful for all of our blessings and praying, you know, praying for peace on earth. Again, it would be a really good thing if we could have peace on earth, especially now. Um, and I said, since it's the Christmas season. I am going to plug my book, uh, Grit and Granite, and actually I grew up in a Scandinavian household, and Christmas is, a, you know, described in very rich detail a kind of childhood Christmases I had, because my mother was Swedish and loved Christmas, and it did Christmas over the top. In fact, in our family, it takes us two to three days to finish celebrating Christmas because we do 12 days of Christmas. So we have to, everybody gets 12 presents the first Christmas Eve and then Christmas Day and then and it goes on and on and on. 
But well, again, it isn't about giving the present so much. It's about sharing the love and joy of our families together and celebrating the light in the mar- midst of the darkest part of the year. So uh, I love you know. So if you want a Christmas present, you can get it on. You can get written granted on Amazon. You can get it on Audible. It's wherever fine bookstores are sold. And lastly, I want to make a plug for my newsletter. It seems to be getting some some traction here. It's Substack. It's Kate Catherine Johnson at Substack.com. Um, it covers the same topics that we have her on the show, but it's a two to three minute read and it delves, it updates the information and it also provides some more interesting perspectives that we can't always get into on the show. So I hope you have a happy holiday season. We'll do, um, I'll be back next week with another fun show. Um, but I wanted to thank you again for joining us today and wish all of you a very happy St. Nicholas Day. This has been the KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on the KJ Show.